Hello, everyone. Very pleased to be here with you this morning, and especially pleased to be here with Rosie. Um, let's get right into it. As a financial journalist, uh, the, well, the first thing I wanted to ask you about was your time as treasurer, and specifically the moment that you arrived at Treasury. At that point, we were in the height of the financial crisis, so this was 2008, 2009, and uh, you were asked to join the transition team, helping to establish some regulations and policies that would stabilize markets and stabilize the U.S. economy. And then you were asked to become treasurer. So not only was that a senior leadership position at an important time in our nation's history, it also required you to manage an, an enormous organization with thousands of, thousands of employees. I imagine that that is difficult for anyone to prepare for. How did you manage that transition? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm thrilled to be back. I think many of you might have heard me speak before, but I promise you this is new material. I promise <laughs> you. So I'm thrilled. And thank you, Sid, for inviting me. It's always great to be here. Um, so, you know, for me, being part of this Treasury Federal Reserve transition team was very important to me, and obviously it was before I was treasurer. So I think everyone here may know Aida Alvarez. Aida Alvarez was the uh, SBA administrator under Clinton. She had recommended my name uh, to be part of this transition team. So Congress had just passed that legislation in October of 2008 called the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, and that was the legislation that turned into what is known as a Troubled Asset Relief Program. So the Obama team was looking for finance professionals to come in to implement that legislation should Obama win in November of 2008. And so I was managing director of investments for a $22 billion firm based in San Francisco. Um, when Aida called me to say that one of her former colleagues was putting this team together, if I was interested, um, it was a big decision. My daughter was eight, my son was 12. I was living in California, and it was, um, you know, it was a crazy time. It was the height of the financial crisis. But for me, when you get that call, you can't really say no. It was obviously a very, very important time. And I had just completed this major transaction at work. So literally, I was going to take this 14-week vacation, which ended up being this transition team appointment, and I, and I loved it. And so there were about two dozen of us who were on this team. Um, and we worked on everything, obviously, from the, you know, the capital purchase program, the home affordable refinancing program, uh, uh, all the, 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 the infusions of capital, if you will, into the economy to put us back on track. And of those two dozen or so people who are on this team, seven of us were recommended for a permanent appointment. I was one of the seven. And I chose the Treasury of the United States for a number of reasons. One. It is a cool title, I'm not gonna lie. It's a great title, it is, it is. But, and maybe many of you know this, the five, there at that time, the five previous, there had already been five Latinas who were treasures before me. But I wanted this position to be substantive. I wanted it to be relevant to the economy. I wanted it to be relevant to treasury. And so I cobbled together the portfolio. I'm actually the first treasurer in the history of our country to have the portfolio that I had, which included oversight over the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and the US Mint. But more importantly, in my mind, I was appointed as a senior advisor to the secretary. That meant something to me, to be part of the senior team that was able to meet with him every morning. Not only that, I specifically asked for the chair of the advance Counterfeit Deterrent Steering Committee, which is the only formal collaborative that exists between Treasury, the Secret Service, the Federal Reserve. And as the chair, and the reason why I wanted to be the chair is it was during that time of the transition that I came up with this concept of redesigning our currency that put the portrait of a woman on our Federal Reserve notes, actually for the first time in our history. That's when that idea came about. And as chair of the ACD, I would be the only person in the world who can make a recommendation on, our on the future of our currency to the secretary. Mm -hmm. So that's how all that came together. I literally cobbled together my portfolio, and I would not have taken the job if that was not approved. I was not going to be a ceremonial position cornered somewhere signing money for a living. I wanted to be relevant to what was happening to the economy and for this specific idea. You know, you mentioned it's a cool title. One thing I can't imagine you ever get used to is seeing your name on the <laughs> currency. 
I mean, how, how, do you, how does that make you feel? It, so it must be surreal, it right? is. So here's why it's so important personally on, on, on so many levels. First of all, you know, I put my full name on there. Yeah. So my middle name is my husband's last name, but it's also my kid's last name. So I wanted to make sure that my kids were well represented uh, in this journey because obviously they had to move when they moved. Um, and I remember when Secretary Geithner, the, the way it happens when you first see your name roll off the printing press is the secretary has a small ceremony with his family and they come over and they kind of see it coming off the press. It was actually the first time that a, that a secretary has ever invited the Treasury of the United States to join the family. So it was my family, Tim's family, together seeing this roll off the press. Was, so it was, it was surreal, mostly because you know my mom was there and it was my kids, etc. cetera. Um, but what's even more kind of strange, I guess, is because I was there in the administration for so long, um, ready for this, my name is still being printed on money. So I just found out, and, and this only came up because I was on CBS, the talk last week, and they needed to know this little, this little tidbit, which was how much money does my name appear on? So I just found this out, literally, hot off the press, ready? <laughs> so my name currently appears, well, actually, let's see, there's, right now there's $1.71 trillion of US currency in circulation worldwide, 1.71 trillion. My name is on 1.69 trillion dollars. So, <laughs> it's the weirdest thing, it is, it's weird. Everyone's gonna be taking out their wallets now oh, to, to, to validate. It that. is definitely world domination, <laughs> but I'm still, I'm still being printed, and here's the thing, the Guinness Book of World Records wants to declare it as a record, but they can't do it until they stop printing my name, which isn't gonna happen until, I guess, later this year. So it is, a, no one in the history of the world has ever had their name appear on that much money ever. So it is kind of weird. And it's a great business card, by the way. It's a fabulous <laughs> business card. Or a backstage pass. <laughs> so Delia was saying we'd be talking about your journey, and I wanted to step back just a little bit because as we were preparing for this discussion, talking just a few moments ago, you told me sort of an incredible story about your journey to Treasury. Um, and how you even got on the radar screen of the administration. But I think this ties in very well to your advocacy for, for Latinos as well. Could you talk about um, your attendance uh, to the, uh, the convention, the Democratic Convention in 2008 and how that led to all of what you just described? Yeah, so what a, what a great journey that was. And so uh, I, first I want to acknowledge that Carolina Espinal is here. Where are you? Where is she? There she is. So, so, so everything that I'm going to say, you were there. You were there, so you can, you can check, you can keep me in check to make sure that I'm not exaggerating anything. Um, but I saw her earlier and it was just great because Stephen was asking me this, this story. And so as I'm spewing out all these crazy, crazy facts, I'm, I'm asking Car Carolina, is this correct? Is this correct? Because it is a little crazy. Um, so, you know, growing up in California, uh, one of nine kids, I, I never really had to think too much about being different, right? Because you know, uh, being very, being raised in a very progressive and inclusive environment, you never really notice your differences. You just accept them for what they are, and everyone around you, right? A lot of my friends were gay. A lot of my friends were were of color, etc. So I never really, really understood the concept of being that different because those differences were around me all the time. It really wasn't until kind of I went to Harvard, and that was you know, you realize, my God, no one looks like you. And then again, in the administration, where again, no one looked like me. So, so it, was a, it was a unique experience. But I remember well, in, in, the, in the summer of 2008, I and mean, we all remember uh, when the crisis was, was, was cooking up, right? It was already happening in February of that year with Bear Stearns, et cetera. And, and for me, I, it, 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 I felt like I needed to do something. I wanted to do something. So I literally went to the Democratic Convention in July of 2008 by myself. I didn't know what I was going to do. All I know is I wanted to do something. Now, who else went to the convention, by the way, 2008? Anyone? Denver? All right, a few of us. It was surreal. It was great. It was crazy, but it was also you know, this energy. The hope and change was real. But it was also, I think for Latinos, we were being asked. To, to, to participate in this election. We were being asked to come forward and, and use our voice. And for me, I wanted to really figure out what that meant. What did that mean to be our voice? You know, and I'm a numbers person. My whole career has been numbers-based. And so for me, numbers don't lie. 
And if you look at the, the, the demographics, I mean, we, you know, we are the future, right? No doubt. Just a numbers game, purely by numbers, we are the future. And so I wanted to harness that. I wanted to really think about how to apply that in a way that made sense, that will really empower us to be much more strategic and organized. And so I wanted to figure out what to do and what that meant. And I've always been very active in voter registration. I, I, I did it in, 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 as an undergrad at Harvard, and it's something that I, I really believe in, but I've never really done it in an organized way since then. So um, it was literally at that convention in Denver where I first met Aida, Aida Alvarez. I didn't know who she was, she didn't know who I was, but we clicked and we hung out together that whole time, and it was really great and fun. But it was through that process, it was at, it was at Mickey Ibarra's lunch at the convention. We all know Mickey, I adore him, but he had this huge, gigantic lunch. And, and that's where I just met a number of people that I'd never met before, Victor Miramontes, a number of people who I just loved and adored. And so we kind of hung out together. And so I'm asking this question, how can we make a difference in 2008? What can we as Latinos do in 2008 in terms of trying to, to, to find our place, make our impact? And a lot of people don't know the story, but, um, but I mean, it's, it's exactly what happened. So I'm asking around, you know, is there one particular state where we can make the most impact? Where's the growth? Where are the projections? You know, 2008, our census data was already eight years old, right? So everyone's looking at old data from 2000 without realizing how much the numbers had grown from 2000 to 2008. And it was, it, was, it was one person in particular who said, you know, you should really take a look at Virginia. I'm thinking, Virginia? Interesting. Interesting. So I, I had met Carolina. I, I, I asked, she at the time was working on uh, Senator Warner's campaign in Virginia. And I asked her, I said, can you send me the demographics for Virginia in terms of, of voters? Just send me what you have. You know, back then we were faxing. And she sent me the world's biggest fax. I still remember printing it out or, or getting, it, you know, getting it delivered to my hotel room. I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. It was great. It was exactly what I needed. But I'm pouring through that. I think that was, my, I think, one of my first almost all-nighters. I'm pouring through the information. And I realized that Virginia had one of the biggest gaps in terms of the number of eligible Latino voters versus those who were registered to vote. The numbers were staggering. And here's something else that I realized about Virginia. Virginia had almost as many electoral votes as New Mexico and Colorado combined, where everyone was pouring their efforts. But the sad part about Virginia was that a lot of people were not paying a lot of attention to it. Why? Because they didn't look at the data in terms of where this fertile ground was. Two, Virginia was the formal capital of the Confederacy. We had an African-American candidate. People just think it was never going to happen. And three, it hadn't been Democrats since 1964. So for all those reasons, this uphill battle, good luck, Rosie. You know, nice of you to show up, but you know, thanks. But I, I, I made this decision. I'm, I'm, I'm focused on Virginia. So I, ha I figured out the what, but it's now the how. And this is, by the way, now I'm on day two, I think, of the convention. How am I going to do this? So I got my focus groups together. And I started asking these questions. What is it going to take for us as a Latino community to get out of our seats and do something? How can we do something in this election? How can we make a difference? But what would inspire us? So I started asking this question. Spit out words that inspire us. What inspires us? What drives us? What are our values? And people started throwing out words. Family, food, faith. And on, literally, the alliteration of the F, family, food, faith. I got it. I got it. Football. Virginia, as in soccer, Virginia has a huge fan base of Latino soccer fans, huge. And it just so happened, I'm not make, I'm not making, the, am I making this up? It just so happened <laughs> at that moment in time where I was working, I was managing director of McFarland Partners, my boss, Victor McFarland, owned the DC United soccer team, of which Virginia was a huge part of that fan base. So that night, I, I, I asked for the numbers of, 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 of uh, I looked at the numbers of, of kind of the games, and I figured I'm going to use the games to figure out how to do an on-site registration effort, voter registration effort, and then turn that into a GOTV effort, get out the vote effort. So I figured there's 10 games left between now and the election. The capacity of RFK Stadium is 30,000. The average attendance is 20,000. It gives me 10,000 tickets per game, blah, 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 blah. I, I literally put it all on paper, done. I had it. I had it. I went straight back to San Francisco, went to my boss, Victor. I told him exactly what I wanted to do. I showed him the presentations, exactly what I want to do. He picks up the phone, calls.
calls Kevin Payne, the president of the DC United soccer team, and says, do what she says. Oh my gosh. All right, so now I had the how, but I still had to find like, where's this army gonna come from? I can't do this by myself. How's this gonna work? So Aida uh, introduced me to Henry Cisneros. I go out to meet with him in LA. I never met him before. Hen never met him before, yeah. no, no, no. I tell him what I wanna do. He arranges this conference call with Federico Peña. Federico Peña, at the time, was the co-chair of Obama's campaign. Never met them. I, over this conference call, I explained exactly what I wanted to do. He said he would give it some thought. So there I am in LA at this event. I'm at Ron Burkle's house at 7 p.m. at night in LA at a reception. I get a call from Federico saying, can you be in Virginia tomorrow morning at 7 a.m.? And what do you say when you get a call like that? Yes, of course, absolutely. So I get on a, on a red eye, whatever it was, 11 p.m. red eye. I show up the next morning, and he's organized this breakfast of a dozen, maybe a few more, of all the, the, the point people working in Virginia on these major campaigns. So Carolina was there representing Senator Warner. Uh, there was the New Virginia Majority, the Tenant Workers United, Labor Council for Latin American Advance, Advancement, Voto Latino, Rock the Vote, um, uh, oh, the Obama campaign representative. Um, I'm probably missing a few people, but they were all there. And I show up, 7 a.m., and Federico introduces me to, to the group, and he says, okay, Rosie, go. Oh my gosh. So I explained everything, boom! We were up and running the next weekend. Now, Carolina, you can, Correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm exaggerating, but the percentages that we were working on in terms of where we thought that Latino vote would make would be the tipping point for Virginia reflected almost exactly the percentage by which we won Virginia in general. Now, I'm not saying it was me or my particular project, because obviously it was an army of angels, but there was no doubt in my mind that that was a way to prove that if we as a community are strategic and organized enough, we could win every election, no doubt in my mind. And it was kind of crazy. It was kind of crazy to see Virginia being the darling of 2012 when no one gave it the time of day in 2008. So, so that was, again, that was something very personal for me that I felt needed to happen. Well, it's a phenomenal story, and it really led to, to all these things that have come subsequently, your advocacy for women, your job at Treasury. And what I wanted to jump to uh, before we run out of time, eventually we'll get to some questions from the audience, but um, is Empowerment 2020 and the work you've done since leaving Treasury. Obviously, you have your day job, so to speak. You're still involved in real estate consulting, yep. but your true passion is Empowerment 2020 and, and doing a variety of things that empower women make them more visible, um, and there's actually, well actually, why don't you talk about it, and then there's okay. a little video there. Oh, yes, yeah. so, so I did speak about this at a previous I said, conference uh, in, in general, but Empowerment 2020, for me, you know, I call myself an accidental feminist, but I'm also an accidental educator, and I'm an accidental historian. What I realized in my journey in Treasury, look, I was the first woman confirmed in Treasury. I was the only woman confirmed in Treasury in all of 2009 during one of the most consequential times of our economic history, and I was it. Now, you bring in the ethnic thing, the Latino thing, there were none. I mean, I was the only Latino in all the economic uh, agencies during the transition team, the economic agencies. A little surprising. So when I talk about women being 51% of the population, when you get into the Latinos, we don't exist, period, period. But for women, the reason why I focus now on, on what I call Empowerment 2020, which is the physical recognition of historical American women, and it's also this initiative that I call Women, Money, and Power, it's because it is 51% of the population, and it becomes an equity issue. If 51% of your population is marginalized, it's also a future leadership issue, right? So everyone has a daughter, a niece, a cousin, a wife, a sister, et cetera. So when you think about that part of your world, being marginalized, then you actually do something. You actually want to change it. And so for me, it's almost strange how everything that I'm touching is actually happening in a very great way. It's a, in a very positive way. It's a nonpartisan way. 
But for me, you know, when I realized it wasn't just about currency where women were missing, women were missing everywhere. I'm talking about statues. I'm talking about, uh, you know, in the classrooms. I'm talking about in our textbooks. Everywhere, women just are invisible. I can go on forever about this. And so, so my initiatives are very specific and very focused, but it's not just about a photo or a statue or an image. These are all different triggers, right? So everyone has a different way of, of, of being conscious, right? And, and, and for me, it could be that, you know, for me, it was realizing that women were missing from currency, but it's also realizing the reason behind it. Ready? The reason why a woman has never appeared on our Federal Reserve notes in the history of our country. Ready? No one's ever brought it up. But that goes for just about everything that I'm working on, right? So when I think about the statues, my statue initiative, it's, it's crazy. When I realized walking around DC when I left the administration, DC, our nation's capital, where people come from all over the world to see what we value and whom we value, there's only two statues of real women in DC, outdoors in the public domain. Eleanor Roosevelt, and Mary McLeod Bethune, right? Or, or Central Park. We all know the story about Central Park, right? 23 statues of real women, of, of real people. The women in Central Park, ready? Mother Goose, Alice in Wonderland, Juliet, that's it, <laughs> right? Or San Francisco, my hometown, probably the most progressive and inclusive city out there, some might say in the world. How many American women outdoors in the public domain? Zero. But again, so it's all happening. So, so next year, Maya Angelou is going to be unveiled in front of the San Francisco Public Library. DC, I was their key testimony for eight new statues in, in DC. Central Park, uh, uh, Newark Life, when they heard me speak, came forward. Long story, but uh, it'll, be Mar it'll be Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony next August 26, uh, 2020, which is our suffrage centennial. So more to come. More so, to come. Aside from. <laughs> So the physical manifestations yeah. are one sign of success, but how do you measure the impact that that is actually having? Like yeah. How will you know when you're starting to make a difference as a result of, of, of these uh, representations? Yeah, when I don't have to talk anymore. That's, <laughs> I mean, so, so it, I mean, it gets to this parody thing, right? So it, it's not just a 50-50 thing for the sake of having 50-50. Again, there's a consciousness that does not exist in this country at all when it comes to women. And, and, and for me, you know, we still share, by the way, of all of the developed nations today, the countries that don't have women on the modern day currency of the developed nations is us and Saudi Arabia. That's mm -hmm. what we share in common. And so, you know, again, it's not just a token thing here and there, it's, it's, it's what it represents. And so for me, it's kind of a, a twist on unconscious bias. So unconscious bias is when you don't realize that you're being influenced by something and you're exposed to. Could it be that we are all being influenced by something we're not exposed to? And the answer is, of course, right? The whole, if you can see it, you could be it, right? So when, when, when we had that public engagement process of, of, of soliciting feedback on who should be in our currency, can you imagine all those emails and letters and souvenirs that I got from all these young girls imagining themselves as future history makers by putting themselves on currency? What that means, mm -hmm. right? or seeing that statue, or seeing whatever it is, again, whatever that trigger is, but it translates into something else, which is my Women, Money, and Power initiative, right? So the three pillars of influence, sex, money, and power. In my opinion, women, women have been relegated to that sex pillar, talking about our bodies, defending our bodies, promoting our bodies, and those positions of money and power remain elusive. So if you look at any of the major social, economic, or political indicators of where women are today, is it any coincidence that we flatline at 20%? I'll just throw out some numbers. I'm a numbers person, right? So 24% women in Congress, 21% for Senate. Um, let's see, 18% uh, uh, female mayors. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, that's fine. It's 21% mayors, 18% governors. Uh, women in the S&P 500 um, for management executive positions. Less than 20%. Corporate boards, women in the S&P 500, what is it, like 24%, 23%? Uh, female tenured professors, it's like 19%. Um, female law equity partners, 17%. Uh, investment, any managing directors in investment banks, 19%. It's like, it's, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it's two-dimensional affirmative action. I think it's when you think, if someone thinks about it for a second, ah, we'll get that one on there. Maybe you'll think about it again, we'll get the two, and then it stops. And then we've been flatlining forever at 20%. I don't think it's an accident. And that means nothing happens at 20%, which is why organizations like this are that much more important, because when it comes to Latinos, 
the numbers are worse, right? We don't exist. That, well, that's sobering. Uh, that's also a good uh, place for us to... <laughs> but there's hope. To, to pause there's and, hope. and uh, see if there are questions from the audience. Maybe you could follow up from, from what Rosie just said. <laughs> this is why this is important. You need to have those conversations. And, and, and when I say two-dimensional affirmative action, I say it with all the love in my heart. We've got to get past that. This isn't just checking a box. It's not the what, it's the how, and it's the why. It's an equity issue, it's a business case. For anyone who works for a corporation, for anyone who works with consumers, for anyone who thinks about where the political power is going to be, where the social power is gonna be, where the economic power is going to be, I am investing in this group, no doubt in my mind. It's, it's a business plan. So for me, all my champions, if you look at all my initiatives from Empowerment 2020, my, my, my partnership, whether it's with Mattel, whether it's with Tops, whether it's with New York Life, whatever it is, with Google. Oh, we can show, hopefully we can show that video. Um, this is huge. And so for me, it, it's finding those partners where I can kind of redirect their core skill set for this particular effort. And by the way, this is not what I do for a living. This is not what I do for a living, but this is what I live to do. No doubt in my mind. Can we show that video real quickly? When you look at a note, you see a figure from our nation's history staring back at you. They're like these tiny history lessons in our pocket. But for over a century, no U.S. note has featured a woman. My name is Rosie Rios, former treasurer of the United States. In 2015, I worked with the Department of the Treasury to create a list of hundreds of historic women whom the American people recommended to appear on U.S. currency. The following year, Harriet Tubman was chosen from this list to be the new face of the $20 bill. This was historic. But I couldn't help but think, why do we have to choose just one? Couldn't there be some way to celebrate all of these women on our currency? Notable Women is a project that lets you put 100 of these history-making women onto any U.S. note. To make this possible, we're using augmented reality. You just hold your device over any U.S. bill, and you'll see these historic figures in a place you've never seen them before. There is no better place for this than in our schools. It has the names on top. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. definitely cool. Here, these notable women can continue to inspire the next generation of history-makers. With this technology, anyone with a phone and a dollar has a new way to experience our nation's history. Super Thank so, you very much, thank Rosie. Thank you. Thank you so much.